All right, so sacred families, developing the family according to God's design. This is lesson number eight. The title of this lesson is Role Reversal. Role Reversal. Um, just a uh, reference here, Gary Thomas, a great book, by the way, Sacred Parenting. So in his book, um, Sacred Parenting, uh, Gary Thomas describes how raising children shapes our souls as parents. Very interesting concept. Raising children actually shapes us as individuals. And he's referring to the effect that our children have on us as we go about parenting them. We think we're having the effect on them, we're molding them, but little do we know that they are molding us at the same time. So with this idea in mind, I'd like to share some of the, you know, the spiritual lessons which he mentions that our children teach us in this parent-child uh, relationship. So one of the things that our kids teach us as we parent them is uh, raising children teaches us to value character and service over comfort. Raising children teaches us to value character and service over comfort. Our natural inclination in raising children is to make life as easy as possible for them. I mean, it's a natural thing that parents do. We want them to have a better life than we had. We don't want them to suffer. We don't, we don't want them to have the difficulties that we may have had. We want them to avoid those things. We don't want them to make mistakes. You know, the mistakes we made, the bad habits we had, the, you know, just the trouble we got into. We don't want them to, you know, we, we want to say to them, I did that, I tried that. You don't need to even try that. I'm telling you right now, there's nothing there. Every parent is like that. And of course, we want them to be happy. You know, if, you, if you ask parents, fill in the blank, all I want is for my children to be one word, well, happy. We want them to be happy. But one thing that God is trying to teach us through child raising is the value of service and character over comfort. Let me explain a little bit. As Christians, we know this, but it seems that we forget it once we become parents. Like we understand, you know, uh, being a Christian involves a certain element of service. Uh, in our lives, a certain element of maybe suffering to do what's right and so on and so forth. But the minute we have children, we kind of forget that as Christians. As parents, we work hard at making our kids as safe and as comfortable as possible, and we hope that the elements of service and character will develop automatically. We think our job, my job is to keep my kids safe and comfortable and you know, avoid any trouble in their life. And all this business of how their character is formed and all this business of them learning how to serve, all that, that'll just come naturally, but it, it doesn't. As a result, we create hyper-vigilant parents that constantly advocate for their kids at every point of their development. You know. If a child gets bad grades, well, it must be the school or the environment, it must be the teacher's fault. It can't be my kid's fault, it certainly can't be my fault. It's got to be the fault of the school. Or if the kid doesn't get enough playtime on the field or on the ice or whatever, well, it's got to be the coach's fault. Coach must be biased. So we overvalue and overprotect our children to the point where they, they never learn from failure. That's the point I'm trying to make here. They don't learn from failing. So when every child is special, and failure or weakness is papered over with meaningless report cards and awards for being friendly, children are being you know, programmed with a false image of the world which will cause confusion and resentment later on. It's okay that the child is the center of the world when he's two years old, that's fine. But if he still thinks he's the center of the world when he's 12 years old, <laughs> he's going to have problems later on because he's going to find out the hard way that the world doesn't think he's the center of the world. And that'll be a great disappointment to him. Success, even if it's fake success, usually gratifies parents more than the kids. But failure produced by an honest assessment of ability and performance instills wisdom into a child. I remember as a child things were different then. I'm not saying they were better, I'm just saying they were different. When I was a child, there was an automatic, you found out where you stood in the pecking order at school. 
you found out who could beat you up in a hurry and who you could beat up and eventually you took your spot and you stayed there. Because you may have picked on the wrong guy or maybe the, the bully pushed you and you pushed him back and then he cleaned your clock and you realized, okay, that's the guy I got to stay away from. Today, you know, boys and girls, boys especially, they, they don't have a chance to learn where, where do I stand because everybody just has to be okay with everything. So we overprotect our children to the point of absurdity at times. Schools, for example, ban dodgeball. Remember dodgeball? They ban dodgeball because there are clear winners and clear losers in this game. And the idea is that, well, this game could harm a child's self-esteem. <laughs> Listen, if you get hit in the face with the dodgeball, you're out, <laughs> period. And you got a big wealth on your forehead. I know, it's so incorrect. But there's clear winner, or you're the first one to get, you know, there's 20 kids on each side and somebody grabs the ball and you're the first one out. You get hit right in the kisser with the, with the ball. You're the first out. You're in the back of the line now on the other side trying to catch the ball. In front of everybody, you got to be the first one out. Well, that says something about your skill in avoiding dodgeballs. Dr. Melody Rode, a child psychologist, writes in her book, if we protect our children from all risks and all challenge and all possibility of rejection or failure, they likely will become developmentally stunted and immature. Overprotection is for our benefit. It's comforting for us. But in the end, it's a grave disservice to our children because it traps them into childhood. Growing up means you begin to experience failure at different things. You know, I remember when I was working at Oklahoma Christian University as the Dean of Students and I was responsible for discipline, disciplinary affairs. So if somebody got into trouble, they had to come to my office. And there was a girl once who was brought to the office because she had, she had failed curfew. She came in after curfew. It's a residential university for those who don't know. And she came in after curfew and the, the, the hall director smelled alcohol and so gave her a breathalyzer test because uh, the, the university has a zero tolerance for alcohol use while you're a student and while you're living on campus. And she blew it. I mean, she failed it terribly. You know, the thing turned purple. You know. So we, have a, we had a policy in how we dealt with students who, you know, first offense, they had to take a course, they had to go for some kind of counseling you know, to see if there was a problem there with substance abuse and then they were suspended for a time, but they were let back in and anyways. Well, this girl's father <clears throat> showed up at school the very next day and threatened to sue us because of what we had done. And I tried to explain to him, we're not, your, your daughter is very guilty. There's no question about that. And she could benefit from what we're going to try to do to help her. We're not going to, we're not going to uh, eject her from the college we're going to put her through a special program that we have to make sure that this isn't a real problem with her. Pfft, wouldn't hear of it. Because in his mind, his princess, there's no way that his princess was going to be humiliated by going to a, you know, a substance class and a, and a prevention class. No, no, that, that wasn't going to happen. So he took her out of school. Imagine you're paying you know, 20,000 bucks or 25,000 bucks a semester to send a child to a private Christian university because it has certain high standards of conduct. And if your child doesn't manage to you know, conform to that, instead of allowing the child to you know, experience the consequences of her decisions, she wasn't a little baby, she was 18 years old, 19 years old, no. He papered that over to make sure that wouldn't be on her record, pulled her out, brought her to another university. Did he help her? No, of course not. And so my point is raising children forces us as parents to choose what we really want in life and what is really important. Because what we want for our children is really what we want for ourselves. <coughs> Gary Thomas says that his children are the mirror of his heart. I like that. They're the mirror of his, of his heart. If by our actions and our intention we see that our children 
the only thing that they're striving for is to be happy or to be safe or to be successful, then God has shown us how worldly we are through our children. In other words, the things that our children want, if the only things that they want are the things that we've given them to want. And if all they want is to be successful, well that shows you what you've managed to teach them. You see your own values in the things that your own children are pursuing. I mean, that's not 100%, obviously. Parents, I've met many parents, they did their very best, they tried, children make bad choices. But in general, in general, I mean, what profit is there if a child has good esteem because he thinks he's special, he's never been seriously injured, he's polite, popular, and successful? I mean, what more can you want? Well, how about the fact that he's unaware that his soul is in danger and the world is a fallen place needing a redeemer? How about that? How about that he'd be aware of that too? We're not discounting the other side. What parent doesn't want their children to be successful? Of course. But only that? No awareness at all of spirituality? I suppose what I'm trying to get at is that you, you see how important spiritual things like the kingdom of God and the Lord Jesus is to yourself by the place these things take in your child's character and soul. Again, there are exceptions, but this is kind of the rule. So, God reveals the depths of your commitment to Christ by the intensity of His presence in the life of your children as they grow, as they go. And you'll see His presence in them if they learn the truth about failure and how to deal with it in their own lives. And if they're trained to place service over comfort in their families and society. It, you know, it's wonderful to see our children you know, uh, be on the team that wins the cup. That's great, I've been there myself, you know, watching our kids compete, it's wonderful, it's exciting, it's fun. I, I, believe me, I'm not making a harangue against you know, having our children compete or do things and be in a theater or sports or whatever, whatever they want. But it's also a great joy to know that your child has also volunteered at church to go bring you know, baskets or food to the shut-ins. Yeah, that, that's also a good thing and that your child at some point earns some money in the summertime, you know, for school, and talks to you about, so how do I do the giving thing? Can I give, can I give? How do I put it in the plate? Do I have to put it in an envelope? Because I'd like to give. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. So it's not either or, it's not no activities, no sport, no, no, no. no. It's both and. That's the, that's the thing that I'm, I'm trying to get a, across. So parents you know, don't want their children to struggle, but in allowing them to do so, we permit God to work out the character of Christ in their souls. And this is hard for parents, very difficult for them, but it does bring, it does bring joy. Okay, so God teaches us to value character and service through this experience of raising children. God also uses children to teach us how to handle anger, how to handle anger. Little story here, a preacher decided to preach a sermon on anger and when he offered the invitation at the end of the lesson, 19 people came forward for prayer and every one of them was the mother or father of a small child. <laughs> I mean, nothing stirs up your emotions like raising small children. I never realized that I had a bad temper until we had four children ranging in ages from one to five years old. That's when I found out, man, have I ever got a bad temper. <laughs> Parenting brings out all kinds of emotions, but especially anger. So what are the situations that provoke parental anger? If this was a discussion type class instead of just a straight lecture type class, I'm sure we could spend a you know, half hour on the, the type of situations that stir up anger in parents. How about the terrible twos? How about the terrible tween stage? How about uh, disobedience? How about flagrant defiance? You see your anger pop when your child says, I will not. What? <laughs> the first time your child 
doesn't disobey you. Disobey you, you know, they sneak around, they do it, they're not supposed to. But when they think they can just stand there with their hands on their hips and just defy you, yeah, go ahead, see what you're going to do. <gasps> you want to see your temperature? Boom, you, you think you, you got anger problems? You'll find out at that moment. How about when children do dangerously foolish things? You don't know whether to hug them after because they're safe or to beat them up because of the stupid things they did like snowboard off the roof of the house, you know, stuff like that. <coughs> Drop your brother from the second floor of the house onto a trampoline. Just, those are just things I'm thinking of at the moment. Now in general, men tend to get angry because of emotional frustration. Men are not always well suited to deal with the variety and subtleties of emotions that are stirred up by parenting and parenting especially small children. Men are not good at that in general. Many times for men it just comes out as anger, not just towards the children but a shotgun type of anger that, that bruises everybody in the family. Not just anger at one little kid, but that little kid is doing something for the 50th time, then all of a sudden it's like a bomb that goes off, ba-boom, and everybody gets hurt. And women, being more adept at handling complex emotion, they tend to express their frustration as a type of woundedness. You know, after all I've done, this is how you treat me? That type of feeling, that type of attitude. It's not as raw as anger, the type that men have, but it gets the job done emotionally. Now God didn't give us children just to show us how easily we can become angry, but He does use this natural consequence of parenting to mature us spiritually. I firmly believe that. <laughs> Gary Thomas in his book says, learning to deal with anger is graduate level Christianity. Our children constitute our homework, our mixed emotions become our textbook, and the character that results will reveal our final grade. Very true. So how do you deal with it? How do you deal with parental anger? Well, our goal as parents is not to eliminate anger, but rather to learn how to handle anger without falling into sin. Without falling into sin. Because anger by itself is not sin, it's just emotion. That's all it is, it's just emotion. Usually it's when two emotions crash into each other. Stress and impatience, boom, you're stressed and then something the child does makes you late. Boom, anger. That's what anger is, just emotion. Anger can be righteous and motivational when it is a reaction to sin or waste or injustice of some kind in the world or in our family, even in ourselves. You know, it's righteous and correct when it moves us to action to seek God's righteousness. For example, Moses, you know, when the people sinned with the golden calf, he was angry, but what, what did he do? He disciplined them. Or Jesus, when he cleansed the temple, what did he do? He cleansed the temple. He got rid of the, you know, the merchants who were selling and trading you know, within the temple walls, which was against the law. They, could, they, wouldn't, they shouldn't do that and they were also not being honest with what they were doing. But anger is sinful when it is an expression of annoyance or inconvenience or wounded pride or loss of control or the desire to impose one's will. Then it becomes sinful. You know, King Saul becoming angry because the people were praising David more than they were praising him. You know, after a battle, the ladies will come out and say, you know, Saul has killed his thousands, you know, and David has killed his ten thousands. And Saul didn't like that. Whoa, wait a minute, the people are applauding David more than me. So he had wounded pride there. His pride was wounded. And because of that, he became angry and wanted to get rid of David. Or in the uh, parable of the prodigal son, the elder brother being angry with his father. 
in this parable because he resented his brother. You know, this brother of mine that wasted everything and now he comes home and you kill the fatted calf for him and for me? You never even, you know, you never even killed a goat for me and my friends? What was that? I think it was called jealousy. The anger born out of jealousy. Same emotion. In every instance, always, it's always anger, except sometimes the anger is righteous, moves you to do something which is right. You know, that's enough, well, enough of this injustice. I'm going to stand up, speak truth to power. That kind of anger makes you, you know, and then anger born out of jealousy or pride or impatience. So what's, what's the point? In parenting children, we have to first acknowledge and accept that this experience is going to provoke us to strong emotion anger. But God will mature us through this process and He provides some you know, parameters to guide us into the spiritual maturity that comes from anger. In other words, dealing with your anger caused by raising children helps you to mature as a Christian. So what are some of the things to do that the Bible says concerning angry, anger? Rather? Well, first of all, go slow. James 1.19, understand this, my dear brothers and sisters, you must all be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to get angry. What happens sometimes when a, something a child does and makes us angry and they go, but daddy, and then never mind, I'm talking here, you know? You're, you're not quick to hear. You're not slow to speak. You're not slow to let the anger come out. We have to be cautious how we use strong emotion with little children. They, they, they can't, you know, an adult and an adult, you, know, you, you blow anger at an adult, well, he's an, he or she's an adult, they can receive that much. They've got a capacity to receive a charge of emotion coming in, because they're adults, they get it. But a four-year-old child, doesn't have the same capacity to intake a blow of anger from an adult. So we have to be careful how we use any kind of strong emotion. Uh, our team wins, we're jumping up and down and we're red in the face and we're, yes, <laughs> all the joy in the world, you know, and they don't, they don't get it. Any strong emotion, any strong emotion, we need to be careful with small children. Anger to point out and to remove sinful and foolish and dangerous behavior, it can have its use. But anger to simply express annoyance or to bully our way into accomplishing our will is counterproduction, counterproductive rather for parenting and it's sinful. You're already bigger and stronger than the kid. You don't have to add, you, know, you don't have to completely crush them with the anger on top of all of that. So because we are sinful, we need to be cautious in how we use strong emotion in parenting. Small doses, remember. A slight raise of the voice to get some attention. A more firm voice and attitude on how, stop, come here, look at me, sit now. You know, yeah, you're still speaking out of a certain amount of anger because of what they've done, because of concern for safety or whatever, but it's controlled. You, you haven't completely lost it. Because when you've lost it, they're dealing with the fact that you've lost it. So they're not even hearing what you're saying. They're, they're not, the message is not coming through. All, the only thing coming through is you've lost it. And what that creates in them is insecurity. Oh yeah, isn't that great? <laughs> they haven't learned anything about what they were doing wrong. All they go to bed with that night is insecurity. And what does insecurity breed? Well, it breeds acting out. <laughs> they act out more because they're insecure. And how do, we, how do we respond to them acting out? Well, we get even more mad. <laughs> so, I mean, it's not funny, but So go slow, small doses. Number two, time limit. Let's have a time limit. 
Paul says, and don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. Ephesians 4, 26. This is not a timetable here. You know, instead, don't let the sun go down. We're thinking, okay, we got to solve all the problems before 7 p.m. The, sun, the sun's coming down at 7.26, so we have to resolve everything by set. This is an expression, a Hebrew or Greek expression. The sun go down is a metaphor suggesting that our anger should have its season, its time, and no more, lest it control us. In other words, yeah, you're angry, and yeah, whew, I need to cool off. I'm going out to cool off. I'm going to take a walk. I'm going outside for a minute here. I got I to decompress here. But if you've still got your mat on three days later, you see what I'm saying? The season for your anger here is being prolonged beyond the time that it needs to be prolonged. Now the anger is controlling you. Okay? Sometimes we have a right to be angry, but being angry all the time is not right. You can't avoid being angry, but you can contain it to its proper season and avoid what happens. The thing is, if you've got your mat on and you're going out of your way to stay in the mad zone, the anger zone, the problem is that the anger, that emotion, begins to become something else. It transforms itself into bitterness. It transforms itself into resentment. It's no longer anger, it becomes something else, something uglier and more, more dangerous. Number three, control anger. Control anger. Love does not demand its own way. It is not irritable and keeps no record of being wrong. There, that irritable there, that's the word meaning easily angered, touchy, sensitive. Paul says that those who aspire to be elders are not, quote, quick-tempered, Titus 1.7. So we need to govern our anger with reason and maturity, patient wisdom. Talk to yourself. That's what I do. I say to myself, really? You're still angry about that? Controlled anger is like a, a surge of energy that moves us to get things done or said or finished or started. But uncontrolled anger is like a bomb going off and it hurts everybody in the area, everybody. I've done that, I've blown up in my own house. And I mean, even the guilty kid, all four of them didn't know which one, <laughs> which one you know, was supposed to get the shrapnel because everybody got hurt. And the house got very quiet, daddy got mad, daddy blew up. Everybody was quiet in the house. Everybody was tiptoeing around. And for about 10 seconds, that felt good. For about 10 seconds, that felt good because it said, all right, people are listening to me. I finally got through to everybody. Everybody's just climbing up. And that's okay for 10 or 15 seconds, but then, you know, when your natural adult reason starts to kind of break through that, and says to you, well, look what you have done. Congratulations. <laughs> You've scared off the kids. Your wife doesn't know what to do with you. Apology time. Number four, be honest. Be honest. What does Jesus say? Hypocrite, first get rid of the log in your own eye, then you will see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. Some parents are easily provoked and they give vent to their anger caused by their children, but they rarely work up any anger over their own failures. What about getting angry at yourself? Getting yourself moving. Anger becomes a problem when we only use it to chastise or motivate our children, but not ourselves. So if we hate the sin uh, 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 and the foolishness in our own hearts first, then we'll grow in the ability to practice slow, controlled, righteous anger with others, especially our children. You know, anger is like a torch. You know, psh, you know welding torch, you know, it, that thing is, that thing could set the whole house on fire, but if, it's, if used carefully, 
you know, it can repair things, it can make things, you know, it can weld two, two pieces of steel together that can't be broken, but it's very focused, isn't it? It's very, very focused. That's what anger is like. It needs to be very, very focused to achieve something. Otherwise, if it's just you know, gasoline and a match, boom, then it destroys everything. Of course, the response that we ultimately want to cultivate in our children is love, not anger. But when the immaturity or the sin of our children does provoke anger, God can use those moments to build in us the highest form of Christian maturity into our character. Again, I, I quote Gary Thomas, he says the following, just as God's response to his children reveals his character, so parenting reveals our character. So we're very proud of our children when they achieve things. We are, all of us, you know, school goals or whatever. Whatever they do, we're proud of them. But we have to also accept us, not all, but a certain amount of the blame when they do other stuff. You know? Some of that is us too. Not all of it, but some of it can be laid at, at our doorstep. So through our children, God quickly teaches us the limits of our patience and he invites us to be more perfectly remade into his image through the discipline of parenting. We don't realize that parenting is a discipline in itself. You know, just like you know, doing sit-ups or, or you know, running for a marathon, there's a certain bodily discipline you have to do. If you're playing golf, you got to hit that ball a thousand times before you might hit it straight. You know, parenting is the same thing. It's a discipline that we learn as we go. More important than hitting a ball, however, because the results are you know, a lifetime. A lifetime sometimes of, of, of heartache, uh, but many times a lifetime of, of joy and pride and encouragement for us as parents. Okay, so there's a little role reversal, what our kids teach us. 